Okay, let's um, let's give this another um, minute or two. Um, and let's see, any comments or uh, questions about anything in the news or uh, about the homework or anything to start off with? Okay? I do, while we are, <coughs> while we're, we're waiting on it, the, mo the most interesting, let's say, thing in the financial news this the last couple of days that I thought has been what happened to Volkswagen. Does anybody know what happened to Volkswagen stock over the last couple of days? What is Volkswagen? Volkswagen is this German company that makes the little cars that uh, that that look like Beatles, okay? Just like the United States stuff. But um, Volkswagen is a company, a German company that manufactures cars, okay? And um, suddenly, for a couple of, for a very brief period of time this week, Volkswagen was the most valuable country, company in the world, okay, by total market capitalization. What was market capitalization? It was the share price of the stock <coughs> times the number of shares outstanding. Okay, and everybody remembers that, right? So why did Volkswagen suddenly become the most valuable company in the world? And the reason was because there were a lot of people trying to sell its stock short. Okay, and they got caught in a kind of a funny situation where there were a bunch of hedge funds and companies that apparently expected that Volkswagen stock was going to go down. And so they decided to sell it short, okay? And so they borrowed shares from some company or some, uh, some, some party, okay? Now, with the understanding they had to pay, give the shares back here, okay? And so what did they do? They sold the shares, okay? Invested the money as they wanted to, and watched as they hoped, Volkswagen stock dropped. But instead, and apparently, a large amount of people, for some reason, thought Volkswagen stock was going to go down. After all, a lot of stocks have been going down lately. It doesn't seem like a bad, bad bet. Enough so that they were apparently like 12% of the total shares of Volkswagen were shorted. Okay? So a lot of people were betting on, down on it. But what happened instead? Apparently, a company agreed to sort of buy Volkswagen, okay? And suddenly, their price went up, okay? And so Volkswagen's price, instead of going down, maybe it went down for a little while, but then it started going up. And what is the problem now? These people who had borrowed it had to buy shares, okay? They owned shares back at this particular date, okay? And so, at the time when there's a lot of people who suddenly need to buy shares, the company is seemingly now doing very well. The prices are going up, right? And nobody wanted to sell it to them. They needed so many shares and no one wanted to sell it to them. So the price kept going higher and higher and higher, okay, until it reached ridiculous proportions, okay? The price of Volkswagen apparently went up by a fact four times within a matter, you know, with a big mature company, went up by a factor of four within a couple of days. As this deadline approached, and people desperately tried to buy the shares that they promised they had to give them back to who they shorted from. And of course, once this pressure stopped, then there was no longer any artificial demand for the Volkswagen shares, and they dropped, you know, suddenly back down to more, you know, they dropped by 50% the next day, okay? So there's no longer this, this artificial demand for it, okay? So any questions? So the people who shorted it and didn't, you know, didn't, didn't cover it somehow until it late, late really got burned, okay? But uh, that's okay, I don't, I, that's fine with it. Okay, any questions about it? Okay, so that's what I think the most interesting financial news has been uh, of the last couple of days. Any questions about, um, uh, let's say anything else that we've been talking about? Um, any questions or comments about the homework one that got turned in? Okay, we're going to go through them, we'll eventually return them. How many people were basically satisfied with how their predictions from the, um, of, uh, felt that, that, that they eventually generated reasonable prices for the options? I see two people. How many people think they did not develop reasonable prices? The theory broke down. Okay, 
no one, no one has said, we'll look at the reports and we'll figure that out. Any questions about homework one or anything like that? Okay, what I'd like to now talk about is continue talking about, um, let's say, our time series modeling that we've been talking about in uh, over the past several lectures. Um, our problem here is we are given as input a stream of time, time series data. We'd like to come up with a relatively concise model of it, okay, for the purposes of making predictions. You see a time series function like Volkswagen, okay? <coughs> Volkswagen stock is doing this. You have it sampled at a bunch of different points. You'd like to somehow predict what the next point is, okay? And we need to have somehow want to take these time points and produce a model, okay, that will hopefully explain what the movements are, okay? And last class we talked about um, one class of models that is very important. Um, these autoregressive models, okay? In an autoregressive model, um, just to remind everybody, let's say the value, if we wanted to predict um, some function f of n, we said it was some constant times f of n minus 1, plus some other constant, perhaps times f of n minus 2, plus perhaps either a, a bigger dependence on history or some other let's say, constant, additive constant there. These were the autoregressive models because the value of this function was taken as depending upon um, values, you know, the, 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 the last several values of the function, okay? And we showed sort of how we could um, compute these, identify these kind of models. Any questions? Now, there are other classes of well-defined classes of models that are interesting. And um, one that turns out to be an important part of what is the big picture of how you do this time series modeling are these things called moving average models. And I find them um, a little tricky to think about because they are defining the um, value of that we're, the function that we're looking for, not in terms of the previous values of the function, the previous observation, but they were that, that depending upon basically the errors, the random terms, the previous random quantities, okay, and that that was somehow what the function was was determined by. And there's maybe a motivation for this kind of thing. Let's say we wanted to compute uh, what was the return, okay, on a stock t days in, into the future, okay? One way that we could figure out, uh, if we wanted a time series for what is the return on a stock since inception, one way to do it, if we have log returns, if let's say our, our error, uh, um, we, we take each percent days incremental <coughs> return and take the log of it, remember the sum of the logs of these returns, this gives us basically the, 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 the effect of multiplying the daily returns. I would say that in some sense the value of the stock today, okay, after T days, is really going to be something like the sum of T minus I, as I goes from 1 to A, to, uh, let's say T, okay? If you think about it, the, the total history of return on Google is going to be a function of the daily fluctuations of Google all through its history. This should, I think, make sense, right? If we think about it, that every day there is a daily return series, okay, which we make marked by the percentage up or down movement. Taking the logs of those things <coughs> give us numbers that when we add them together give the effect of multiplying the percentage returns, right? If we think about this, in some sense that the value of the return on Google today over its history is, can be thought of as the sum of these daily random-like fluctuations since the beginning of history. Does that make sense? And this gives you a model for an interesting quantity, the total return on the stock, in terms of small things that are really random fluctuations. Okay? Any questions? Now the trouble with this kind of a model 
if you look at it is, it depends upon a history that goes back to the beginning of time. A moving average model is one that is going to depend upon okay, a finite history, okay, a finite number of previous random values. Okay? And um, so in general we'll say a moving average Q model is one where the function now is defined by perhaps an additive constant plus some function, some I'll call it constant times each of the previous Q observations. Okay? And um, to give us what this function is. Okay? Any questions here? So, it seems weird to be thinking in terms of defining something in terms of the sum of random fluctuations. But I think it makes sense if we think about that's really what, let's say, global returns are. Okay? Regardless, it should be clear we can define moving average models. Okay? Where the return, okay, or the value of this function is a function of the last, if it's a, a, an MAQ model, the last Q random shocks. Okay? Any questions about that idea? Now, what is a random shock? That's another way to think about it that's, that seems weird. Okay? If we think of a random shock as being the part of a function that we can't um, uh, you know, that we can't predict. The random shock value, the <coughs> observations a, a sub t, really represent the difference between a quantity and its prediction. Okay? So perhaps we could view it that if, let's say, R of d is some kind of a, um, you know, let's say an arbitrary, let's say it's temperature. Okay? Perhaps we would like to predict the, uh, model the temperature. One way to model the temperature today might be if we took a look at what was the average temperature, what was the difference of yesterday's observation from the average temperature. This was, let's say, the average temperature for a day. We take a look at what was today's, yesterday's, the difference between yesterday's uh, uh, temperature and, um, what we would predict it to be, okay? Let's say perhaps the historical average for that day, okay? This would define a model for this in terms of errors, sums of errors, okay? And what an MA model is, is summing something up over basically a function of the, the past Q errors. Yeah. So what's your temperature model? Yes. Yeah. Let's think what I'm trying to do. I was making that up as we go along. But let's think what it, what it means, okay? Perhaps um, C0 is some kind of a, let's say, a baseline temperature, okay? Baseline temperature for the day or for... Well, right now I have this as being constant, right. okay? So, so that would probably, that would be, that would be sort of probably a, a wrong model here. But, um, so look. Let, let's say we live in a world, let's say we live on a tropical island, okay, where the temperature, average temperature is constant year-round, okay? In that case, this would be a constant, okay? What we could imagine is that the temperature today is a function of how much different was yesterday's temperature from the, uh, from, 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 from the usual value. That would be this minus the constant, if you wish. And perhaps temperatures have the property that, 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 there's, that, the, that, that it's not just yesterday's value that matters, but whether there's been a trend. Have the last couple of days been colder than average? Okay? It is possible that predicting the temperature does not just depend upon today's temperature, but that if you know that the last couple of days have also been cold, you might make a different prediction about the temperature than whether the last couple of days have been warm and today happens to be cold. Okay? If so, what you end up doing, you could envision a model here where the, um, the, the temperature is going to be a function of the last several deviations 
of uh, from the uh, okay the last several days worth of deviations from our expected value okay and that gives some kind of an intuition to these kinds of models okay any questions theta is a coefficient how much is it going to depend upon okay the last several days we would probably expect that the 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 um, the most recent observation is probably more important perhaps than the observation from several days before and so we, we these are somehow supposed to be discounting terms okay for predicted for for weighing how do we value the impact of the shock from two days ago okay that's sort of what the idea here is any questions yes okay now now I see what it's types of it would seem to make sense that the sum of the theta should be 1. And frankly, it would seem that, that under the model we're talking about, this probably should be put in there as well. Okay? Not held out as a special term. Okay? But it kind of makes sense that... Well, again, there's no, there's no reason a priori why it has to be 1. But it kind of makes sense that somehow that if we're talking about this in terms of random shock, you know, sort of changes from the mean, in principle, we would want to, to somehow sort of, you're saying, average those shocks. If you're averaging those shocks, that's the intuition between making the sum of the coefficients one. Any questions? Yes? So, yes, your sum from i to i uh, equal to q, but there's no i in the theta and uh, a. Uh, okay, so you're saying that, uh, what, what I think this should be, you're saying this should be i. Yes. Okay, if I make these things i, does that then... That then makes the equation right. Yes. Okay. So let, let let's say it's a badly typeset equation. Okay. But this should be these should be i. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So what's interesting about it? There are these classes of models. We'll see that these models are useful. Okay. Even though, like I said, the intuition of them is, you know, seemingly less clear to me. I kind of have the idea that it makes sense that to have a function which depends upon the last several values of the function. But we can also imagine functions that depend upon the last several deviations <coughs> from expectation of the function. Okay? And anyway, that's what we mean by a moving average model. Okay? Any questions? Well, what's interesting about this kind of a model? Okay? What does its autocorrelation function look like? If we view these average terms a sub d, these a sub d's as being random numbers, okay? Okay, arbitrary quantities that were drawn. It should be clear that r sub d depends upon the last q random values and nothing before it, okay, nothing after it, okay? This is different then if we had r sub t depend upon r sub t minus 1. Because r sub t minus 1 depended upon r sub t minus 2, which depended upon r sub t minus 3. We had for the, for the autoregressive models, we had a world where there was a long, um, the autocorrelation function had somehow a long tail. Here, because the value of this function depends only upon q random shocks and not on earlier values of itself, its autocorrelation function goes to zero once you get beyond the history of this process. That's what's kind of interesting about this process. So if you have an autocorrelation function where it looks something like this, this suggests something that, that might be fit by one of these moving average models. Okay? Because according to this, the function depends not at all upon the value four points ahead of, ahead of it. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay, how do you interpret the autocorrelation function and why, in fact, this, the order of this thing goes rapidly to zero? Goes to zero once you get past the history. Any questions? So this is good because it gives us a way, if we wanted to fit something by a moving average process, it gives us a way to um, set the order of the process, okay? 
by determining how many of these parameters we really need. Okay? Any questions? So how do we fit these moving average models, okay? Let's say we had a simple model, again, where R sub t is going to depend upon some constant plus some constant, you know, another thing, zero, some constant times the random shock one period ago, you know, today's random shock plus another constant times yesterday's random shock. There are three coefficients here we have to determine. How might we figure out what those coefficients are? Okay? The problem here turns out to be a lot harder than fitting the autoregressive models. Remember when we were fitting an autoregressive model, we had the property that we said that Tn, the nth value of our series, depended upon Tn minus 1 and Tn minus 2. Okay? Tn minus 1 depended upon Tn minus 2 and Tn minus 3. If we were given the, the time series of modeling, which is these Ts, we could build this matrix. And then the question of identifying what are the constants such that this times this plus this times this equals this with as little error as possible is a least squares fitting problem. That is not the case in these uh, moving average models. Why is it? Because our matrix, we want to still fit what those constants are. But the terms that we're fitting here are not the actual observed values. But somehow this random shock, this error, this error that we can't really sort of see, OK? <laughs> Well, if we interpret this random shock as the error between our prediction and the observed value, then you might think that, well, why don't we just set up a matrix A sub t minus 1, A sub t, okay, uh, minus 2, and use that to set the value of R sub t. We don't know what these error terms are. And if the error terms are the difference between the observed values and the predicted values, then the size of these error terms themselves depend upon what these coefficients are. So it's no longer a least squares fitting problem. That's sort of what I would like to convince people. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? The argument is somehow that A sub D is really going to be something like the observed value of what the function was at time t minus our estimate of what our t is, our model. But in order to figure out what our estimate is, somehow we need to have the coefficients for our model first. Okay? And that is why fitting this thing is a harder than problem. Any questions? That said, it should be clear we can do something numerically for this. What might be a numerical procedure? Okay. Suppose we guess what the values of these coefficients should be. The C1, the C2, the C0, the C1, and the C2. Once we guess what those coefficients are, we can now estimate what the function value is. We have a model for it. Given our estimate at each point, we can now compute what is the difference between the estimate and the observed value. That gives us a value for our A sub D, for the observed difference, the observed shock. And now, we can then use these coefficients to go back and um, plug, score, now that we have the A sub D values, we can now score how well does do these coefficients and values that we have model what the series is? We would argue that, that if we're trying to minimize the error, we want the sum of the errors to be minimized. So this suggests a numerical procedure where we ran the sample, okay, 
different values of the constant, and then assess how well that, 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 that those um, those constants model the process as a moving average Q model. Okay. Any questions about that? And so there is this collection of numerical procedures, okay, which will try to sample these parameters in an intelligent way. Perhaps they take the space of parameters and start with a grid. If you had two parameters, C1 and C2, you might start out with a grid, okay, try every, you know, quantize this for a certain number of levels, quantize that for a certain <coughs> number of levels. Try each one of these parameter, parameter pairs and figure out what the error is if, if we use that as the coefficients. Certain points in this space are going to have lower errors, in which case we might want to now sample at finer points <coughs> in this space. And based on these kind of numerical procedures, we can now come up with an estimate for what the coefficients are. Any questions about that? Okay. I consider that, that that now reasonably clear, at least to me. If so there's any questions, so. Okay. So what's good about it? We now have an automatic procedure to fit. If we think our model falls into the category of a moving average Q model, perhaps because of how its autocorrelation function looks, we now have a procedure we can call to try to fit it. Any questions? There are other kinds of tricks that we can use to fit these time series models, okay? And one other, one of the, let's say, more important tricks is what we would call a transformation. Sometimes it is hard to model uh, a function by itself, okay? Okay, because the function may not be linear, okay? If we take a look at trying to predict model uh, stock prices, okay, or, or, or let, let, let's, say, let's say we're trying to model something that was uh, the, the gross national product, okay? The gross national product is a um, function that grows exponentially for most countries. Why is that, at least in normal times? Why is it each country has a growth rate? Let's say its growth rate is 5%. That means that the size of its economy is growing by 5% each year. If you took a look at the, um, the growth rate at, at, at the GDP, that's going to define an exponential function. Our time series techniques, the models we looked at, things like, you know, and, and the techniques like correlation functions, make sense for linear functions, but not for nonlinear functions like exponentials. If we wanted to try to model the gross national product of a company, of a country, how fair, you know, what are the changes, how does it grow? We would be better off transforming our data, where instead of taking the raw GDP numbers, we take the log of them. Why do we take the log? The log of an exponential function, of course, reduces something that was exponentially growing to a linear function, okay? And so it might very well be that our way, if we're interested in the time series X of T, which is um, the, uh, the time series X of T, for in this case, gross national product, we might be better off instead modeling Y sub T, which is the log of that thing. Okay? And so doing transforms by taking like the log to, to make it linear seems like a reasonable strategy in working with a time series. Any questions about that? Another idea that might be thought of uh, as to, to taking a time series and analyzing it might be to try to fit a trend to it and subtract it off. Okay? A different way you might think about dealing with the gross national product might have been to say, look, here are some sample values of gross national product. I see it looks exponential. 
If I split the best exponential, I could define a new function. Okay, let's say my y sub t. I could have defined as the original observations minus some constant to the t. Okay? One idea that, 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 that you might see is if you detect a trend that you think about in the function, one way to, to model it would be subtract off that trend in some way. Okay? And that suggests models of something like this, okay? Where we might try to fit a trend, explicitly subtract it off, and then leave our analysis for the residuals after our trend is predicted. Any questions? Okay? This turns out not to be a good idea, okay? But it's going to suggest a, a, a different idea that is actually better. Any questions? Okay. The better idea is something called a differencing transform. Okay? Is that suppose, let's say, you're trying to fit a model for some function x of t. Okay? And it doesn't look linear. One possibility, a differencing technique, would say to define another function y sub t, where y sub t is the difference of x sub t and x sub t minus 1. Okay? Just the difference between two uh, successive values. Okay? And then try to fit this function. Why is this a good idea, or an interesting idea, or a better idea? than actually fitting it, trying to fit a trend and subtract out a trend. Here, if you observe a trend, you had to have estimated a parameter, or what, at least one parameter, for what the trending function is. If you supply a differencing transform, what you do is you take your function and do an operation to it. We you create a simpler series, a hopefully simpler series, without actually having predicted, used a, um, what do you call it, any parameter for it. Okay? You've done a differencing operation. Differencing does not estimate a parameter, although it costs us one time series point. Right? If you have a, 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 a series of ten values, okay? Or let's say four values. If you difference it, you create a series with three values, okay? But if this function is much easier to fit and predict and model, then it gives you a good model to go back and predict this function once you have modeled this well, okay? Any questions about it? Perhaps instead of, mod if we, instead of model modeling um, price values for a stock, if we take the difference, we're now looking at the dollar change each day. That might be an easier thing than to model than the, um, you know, let's say, let's say the, 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 the cumulative price. Okay? Any questions? So what makes differencing interesting is that it gives us a way to remove trends, okay? To remove local trends, okay? Which has the property of making um, things, you know, we, we want somehow all of our time series tools were built around the idea of linear time series functions. Differencing things provides another way to make things transform a function so it might be linear, okay? Uh, you know, um, without using parameters. Any questions? If we do one difference transform, what we end up doing is somehow, um, impact the mean of the series, okay? If you think about it, if we have a, uh, a function and we difference it, what we're really going to be taking off is the bulk of the value here. The difference is going to be accounting for the change rather than the, the mean value of it. Differences allow us to take off, if we take one difference, we can somehow remove trends related to a mean, 
If we take two differences, we can remove trends that impact the change in slope. What do I mean by two differences? One difference created a function y sub t, which is the difference between two successive values of x. We can now define a function z sub t, which is the difference between two successive values of y. Okay? If we take z sub t and substitute in our values for x sub t, z sub t is now going to be the function defined by x sub t minus 2x minus one point back plus x of t minus 2. Okay? This will capture changes in slope better. And so we can now think about performing a certain number of differencing operations until hopefully we come up with a function that can be well modeled. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes? But the model is poly polynomial function. Right? right. So you can't model an exponential function, that's true. But that's why if you had an exponential function, probably a good idea was to transform it with a log transformation first. Okay? So the argument would be that if we wanted to work with a time series, a better model might be, if we think it's exponentially growing, we take the log, we then look and see if we can fit it well. If we can't fit it well, then maybe we will difference it, okay? The re remainder, and see if we fit it well. And if not, maybe take another difference, okay? The bottom line is that these differences give us another mechanical transformation we can do to create a function that is hopefully easier to uh, model. Any questions? Okay. Any questions about that? Here is an example of a um, analysis done on by, by, by the statistician who was trying to analyze the gross national product of a country. We agreed that it was ex that 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 the um, that uh, the uh, <coughs> it was exponentially growing. So the first thing he did was to take a log transformation. The second thing that he did after he looked at it was difference the terms, okay, and created a difference function for it. When he did that, he then did an autocorrelation analysis of what was left. And what was interesting was the residuals are now relatively small, small enough that they fit in the error bars. That we, that we had talked about before, that 1 over square root n error bars. But what's interesting is you still see periodic effects because gross national products go through business cycles. We're in the process now where gross pro, you know, national incomes are going to be going down because of a contraction, right? And there's going to be a period of time things are going to get worse for a while until they get better, okay? But the natural way to work with this kind of time series was first to take a log and then perhaps to difference it, okay? And then seeing what the changes in the logs of the gross, gross pro national products were. When you do the autocorrelation analysis, you see the ebbs and flows that, um, that, you know, that correspond to business cycles. Any questions? Okay. At this point, it may look like time series analysis is this very complicated thing where there is, you know, we have to try, is it possible our model is autoregressive? Is it possible that our thing is moving average? How many differences do we have to take? The thing that makes this thing now much simpler to actually work with is that there is a class, a large space of models you can define called the RIMA models, which stands for autoregressive integrated moving average models. Okay, autoregressive models, these are these ARP models that we talked about, where the value of a function depended upon the P previous values. Moving average meant for the MA 
models. It said that the average, that the value of this function depended upon the last Q error terms. Integrated is some way to get a vowel out of this idea of differencing. Okay? So integrating is supposed to refer to, to differencing. And D is describing the number of differencing steps. So when people do time series analysis, the way that they think about models are these ARIMA models. Okay? Where for any given time series, you can now think there's a space of possible autoregressive history you care about, a space of, uh, of uh, moving average terms, shot, random shock history you care about, and differences. Okay? What you can do now is, for your given time series, try all different values of these parameters and find for your series which one fits your data using the smallest number of coefficients. The number of coefficients are really given by P and Q. So what makes ARIMA models interesting is they are a generalization of all the models we have talked about so far and that there exist automated methods to try to find what these coefficients are for these models. Okay? So if you go to your favorite statistics package, something like the R library, which we'll talk about, um, I think there's going to be a presentation. Who's supposed to give a presentation on R next week? When are you giving your R presentation? Next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. You will find that in a statistics package like R, there exists libraries of functions which take as input a time series and as output will fit the best values of, uh, will either if you give it a value of B, Q, D, and Q fit the coefficients or even better over a space of P, D, and Q try all possible values here fit the coefficients and then assess which model is the best one and pick it for you so the good thing about this, this gives you an automatic way, a fairly automated way, to take an input time series and produce a model for it, okay? With some level of, you know, rigor and, you know, you know, and uh, validation. Any questions about that? Okay? That's why this is an interesting thing and a tractable thing to do. Okay? Any questions? And again, as far as how does the fitting process work, um, in principle, the fitting process can work by the way that we talked about, these numerical methods, where once you specify that there's a history of three here and one here, you try fitting all those four parameters by sampling over, you know, in space, making a, a four-dimensional grid, and then refining it where you think that there are interesting values. Okay? Any questions? Okay? And again, there may be more sophisticated methods. But the bottom line is this is the kind of thing you can do with a statistics package. Okay? And provides a reasonable way to model, okay, an arbitrary set of times type series. Any questions about that? Any questions about these autoregressive models or this whole class of models now? This is what, sort of what the punchline here is. Okay? And it's worth knowing about. Any questions? Okay, these numerical procedures for fitting models depend upon somehow, once you have a set of parameters, being able to tell how good or bad that model parameters are. So it is worth looking at the question of how do you measure how good a model is, okay? So suppose, let's say, I give you a, um, suppose I give you a time series points, a time series course, you know, x1, x2, dot, 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 xn. And I build a model, and I can use my, my model is going to give me values Okay, compute it from my model at um, all of these points. 
how can I decide this is the real function that's generated these points, which we don't know. All we have is the sampled values. This is the gross national product. This is our model generates these values. How can we assess how good our model is? Okay? We need some kind of a statistic to measure the error of, a mo of our model predictions and the original values. Okay? Any questions? What is a natural way to try to measure what the difference is between the observations and the prediction? What would be a reasonable statistic for that? Okay? You wanted to assess a model. You have a model, a program. You say that, in fact, the function is being given by 3x squared minus, you know, minus 4. Okay? These are the values given by your model in time series in response to these observations. Suppose we want a statistic to measure how good this model fits that observation. What kind of statistics are possible? Someone propose a statistic to do it. Someone with a hand. Okay. Square difference. So one possibility might be to try the, the square of the errors, right? What would the error at any point be? That would be x sub i minus x prime of i, right? You're saying square it. And perhaps the sum of the squares as i goes from 1 to n. This would provide some kind of a statistic for how good our model is. Does everybody agree with that? That's sort of the standard idea of a squared error. OK? OK? Any questions? Now, why do we square it instead of x sub i minus x sub i minus 1? Why do we square it instead of just taking the absolute value? Here would be another way to quantify the error of a function, right? Basically, it says for each point, we figure out how far does it differ from the original. Okay? Does it does the prediction differ from what we were making? Okay? And again, the, the absolute value is important because it tells us whether or not, you know, whether we're a, a, a above the, the observe, our model gives us something above the observed value or below the observed value <coughs> is the same thing. Okay? We could get charged the same penalty here. Right? Why then do we square the errors <coughs> instead of just summing up the absolute value of errors? Okay, everybody's heard of mean squared error. Why do people naturally think about mean squared error? Why would, why would this be a potentially more interesting measure than this? Penalize the, penalize the extreme error. This is going to penalize extreme errors, right? <coughs> this says that if we want to think about, um, you know, one way to think about it is uh, perhaps our errors are quantified like this. Perhaps our errors are boom, 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 boom. One point that's very far away, right? You could imagine that there are these, that the sum of these little errors, these green errors, could be said to be the sum of the same as the sum of the blue errors. When you take a minimum as the square of these things, okay, you're penalizing extreme movements more rather than just the sum of the errors. This is the sum of the errors. This is the sum of the squared errors. So extreme things get punished more. Okay? Any questions? Why square and why not cubed? Okay. Well, one reason might be because the sign would no longer be, uh, you know, if it had a negative value, you wouldn't get the absolute value for free. But it's not obvious why, let's say, a priori, the square should be the coefficient that you use here. 
For certain things, it's easier. You know, there's certain things like minimizing least squared error. Somehow, there's something magical about the algorithms for the square there. Okay. But bottom line, when you're designing a penalty function to assess the models, it is not clear, depending upon your application, what that exponent should be. This could be thought of as an exponent of one. Okay. Any questions about that? If you think about it, let's say that, that uh, we were modeling something where um, you were trading, you, you were going to make a prediction about what the stock price was going to be, okay, tomorrow, okay? Let's say that at your model here is predicting the stock price, okay? And let's say you're a trader on it, okay, if the error was the difference between the profit and the loss you made that day. If you're just summing up profits and losses, it's not clear that you care whether your profits, your, your losses, let's say, come in lots of small things versus one big thing. So the bottom line is just to think that, 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 that the, the, the coefficient here of what you're trying to quantify by depends upon your application. One way to think about what least squared error means means that if a value is twice has twice the error, it makes the whole contribution four times less desirable. That's what least squared error means. It means that if I have a prediction and that the error was here, if I have two predictions, one where the error is a distance epsilon and the other where it's a distance two epsilon, in least squared error, what you're really saying is, this is four times as undesirable as this, which may or may not be the case in your particular modeling application. Any questions? The other issue in assessment, if you want to now assess your model, is, is the error of your, the difference between your function on the values it was trained on and the real, you know, the difference between your model and the function it was trained on. Is that really the best measure of how accurate your model is? How much predictive power your model has? We can imagine that if you come up with a well-fitted model, F sub n, there might very well be very little difference between the values of your model and the observed values. But that does not necessarily mean that this function, this model, has a good predictive power. Again, if we thought of this model as defining an nth degree polynomial, it would perfectly fit the space, you know, the, all the data points you trained it on. And then sample, compared at the, the actual point values, there would be no error. When people want to assess models, there's a big question of whether you do in-sample testing or out-of-sample testing, okay? The right way to validate a time series model, okay, would be one where you could ideally train the time series model on a certain number of points that you have, and then use your, once you have trained it, then validate your, your, your model on the rest of the points, the, the points that come afterwards, to see what the predictive power of it is. Okay? And that that's sort of the more rigorous way to try to train it, which works if you have long enough time series. Okay? You can sort of talk about trying to do something like that. Any questions? So recognize that, there, that, 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 that assessing whether your model is accurate. Okay? Um, it, error, minimizing error or squared error gives you an idea of how well your model fits the data, but it doesn't actually give a model a question of how much predictive power your model has. <coughs> Any questions? So if we really want to evaluate what a model is, how good a model is, I claim that there are two factors that you need to consider. One is, of course, the error 
You can talk about it as the sum of the squared residuals. You can talk about it as the sum of the, you know, the regular residuals. This is a measure of the error of the model. But the other question is, um, how many parameters are involved in the model? If we have, as we said, a set of endpoints, and I spin it by an n degree polynomial, I will have a model with the property that it has no residual error. But it involves a large number of parameters. And that, I claim, should be less desirable than a model with a smaller number of parameters. OK? Even if it has a certain amount of error to it. So if you really want to assess over this whole space of models, which is the best one, OK? You need to use some kind of a criteria which affects, which, which, which factors in both the error and the, um, the, uh, what, the, the error and the number of parameters. And two widely used measures are the Aaki's information criteria and the Bayesian information criteria. This one says that for a given model where you've got n time series points, okay, a, a, least, a, a least squared error of n, s, uh, okay, and p parameters, it says that the quality of the model depends upon the error, squared error, divided by the number of points. It makes sense that you have to normalize this because this somehow comes down to what is the average error per point. This is n times the log of that plus 2 times the parameters. An alternate criteria instead punishes the number of parameters more. Okay? He's come out that, you know, that basically it becomes P log N, okay, as opposed to linear in P. Both of these sort of fall out of doing some kind of an information theoretic analysis, okay, of how surprising is a model with these properties, okay? But bottom line, this now gives us a way to somehow completely automate the process of fitting one of these models. You give me as input a time series. I specify a suite of models, let's say my ARIMA suite of models, where my parameters, are, my histories are bounded by a certain amount, and my differencing is bounded by an amount. I can now go fit a model for each one of those parameter values defined in that space of parameters. Then come back and assess it based on its error and its number of parameters to come out with a meaningful model for that. Any questions about that? So what's good about this is it gives us a reasonably automated way to do this kind of analysis and make these kind of comparisons. Any questions? Okay, any questions about these ARIMA models? Why they're interesting, okay? Judging by the way people that face it are looking, they may not be that interesting, okay? But, but what's interesting, about the, the importance of them is that they give us a mechanical way to take a set of points and can sample values and can construct a model. Any questions? Now one other, okay, any questions about that before I change topics slightly? Any questions? Okay. So we've talked a lot so far about volatility modeling. Okay, we talked about how volatility rep represents in some sense the standard deviation of returns. Okay, we said that because volatility has trends, we're better off sort of, if we want to predict volatility, we should take a sample over a certain period of time. We should presumably weight more recent observations more than, um, than, than observations in the past. But, um, because the autocorrelation function has a long tail. But, um, and, and that suggested things like the exponentially weighted moving average model. There is a more widely used class of models, it's a little more complicated, called Gartz model. And what a Gartz model is, Gartz is, uh, stands for generalized autoregressive conditional heteroscedastic, okay? And I like that, it's a very long, complicated thing. Heteroscedastic somehow refers to the idea that the variance is varying over time. 
Remember we defined stationary model, stationary time series. There we sort of assumed that the means and the standard deviation <coughs> were constant over the time series. Here we want to look at functions for areas where the uh, variance is in some sense going to vary over time. Okay? And so what a Garch model is that turns out to have interesting properties a Garch model is defined by a set of parameters here, history parameters. Again, depending upon what the autoregressive component is, how many previous values of the series does it depend on, and a moving average component. How much of it, it depends upon, let's say, the random observations that we see. So according to this model, the Garch 1-1 model says, that the variance today is going to be some constant times our model of the variance yesterday, okay, plus some constant times our observed variance yesterday, meaning how much, what was, the, let's say we wanted to measure the, the uh, volatility today. We had yesterday's stock price fluctuation, and that's what's captured here. We have um, our model for what we thought the, the variance was going to be yesterday. And we also have a historical component. Historically, the variance settles down to a certain point. Remember, we talked about um, how when we looked at the graph of volatility, the VIX index, the world looks something like this, that every once in a while there's a shock. But Essentially, volatility tends to revert to a constant. This VL is our average volatility, okay? Our long-term average volatility, okay? And it says here that the volatility, our, our estimate for the volatility today is going to be a function of three things. Yesterday's observation, our long-term, our, our previous estimate, and our long-term average, okay? Any questions about that? It makes sense that all three of these things should be part of our model, okay? It's perfectly reasonable that the long-term S value for what this should be should be part of our model, okay? And if we weigh these things so that the coefficients alpha, beta, and gamma add up to be one, and all of them are between 0 and 1. Somehow we are blending our three pieces of evidence, okay, in a sensible way, okay, so that our predictions are stable. Any questions? Before when we dealt with these models, we didn't have this component of what the long-term variance is, okay? And if we remove that, then we say that today's observation depends upon Today's prediction depends upon yesterday's prediction, some constant times yesterday's prediction, plus one minus some constant on the observation. That was exactly the exponentially weighted moving average <coughs> model that we talked about. Any questions? So the Garch model is a generalization that factors that into play. Okay? What's interesting about this? The main thing that's interesting about it is that this kind of a process turns out to be mean reverting. What does that mean? If we look at this thing, we can use, once we have a model, once you give me alpha, beta, and gamma, I can now predict what tomorrow's volatility will be. Right? If I now say, well, yes, tomorrow's volatility, I'm going to take as the average, as the, as the thing that actually happened, I can now compute the next day's volatility. And by repeatedly putting my predictions each day in as the next day's observation, I can predict arbitrarily far into the future. We saw, however, that with uh, just using the exponentially weighted moving average model, if there was an upward slope of observations recently, my mean for the next value somehow is going to be greater than the previous one. 
And so the mean of this thing is going to keep growing and growing and growing. The value can diverge. What's interesting about the Garch model is that the expected value of the volatility t days from now is going to be our long-term mean plus some decaying value of our previous our last prediction, our last well-founded prediction, because it was based on relative, on, on real observations. So what's good about one of these Garch processes is that if we now try to predict, let's say that we have a uh, history here where we see a bunch of volatilities, and now we stop on that. And from now on, we try to predict volatility. Let's say, more accurately. Let's say we were in a world uh, actually like this, where we had a long-term history that we knew about for volatility. That's our VL. If we, um, at this point in time, let's say we have all of these real points in history, and now we try to compute our predictions for what the volatility is the next day with an exponentially weighted moving average model. Our volatility will keep going up arbitrarily. What's neat about the, the Garch model is that it will instead, the predictions will instead go something like this. As we get further into the future, our mean, our, our prediction of what the volatility do will revert to the long-term mean. And the speed with which it does that depends upon these parameters, alpha and beta, which is what we weighted the, uh, our previous predictions and our last observations. The more that there was weight in our model on the long-term prediction, remember, alpha plus beta plus gamma, okay, summed up to be one, because it was blending these three pieces of evidence. So this, one minus this is what gamma is. If gamma was big, it depended a lot on the historical component, okay? One minus a big number is gonna be a small number. This is gonna rapidly go down. And so the speed with which our prediction will revert to the mean, okay, is governed by the fitted parameters, okay? And this is probably a better long-term model for what volatility is going to be than just taking the moving average if we want to make long-range predictions. Any questions about that? Okay? It should be clear why a mean reverting model is a good model, a preferred model, okay? And um, again, it happens that this model sort of does that. Any questions? So basically, we now can now think about, given a volatility sequence, we can now try to fit these coefficients the way that we have done before using numerical techniques. Okay, And now we come up with a mean reverting model. Any questions about it? Now, one interesting idea about model fitting is to think about maybe changing the criteria as to what we want to, how we're going to rate how good or bad a model is. Right now, the way that we would naturally think about fitting our models was that we wanted our observed values of, that, that given a observed stream of observations we wanted our model somehow to fit it with the smallest amount of error. That has been the way that we usually think about trying to fit models. There is a completely orthogonal idea or criteria for fitting models that is very interesting that is called maximum likelihood. That fits models not in terms of observed error but in terms of trying to uh, maximize probability of explaining what we see. 
And error here says, when we minimize error, we're saying, hey, look, we're doing a good job replicating the numbers that we saw. In a maximum likelihood criteria, we're instead going to set our models with the property that the observations that we saw were the highest, were, were, were more likely to have occurred under our models than any other model in that class. Okay? And this is actually an interesting idea. And let me try to make it concrete with an observation. <coughs> Suppose, let's say, that I want to figure out what is the probability on a given day a certain number of stocks went down, a certain number of stocks went up, right? Let's let P be the probability that a stock went down on a given day. Okay, there's thousands of stocks out there, right? Suppose I look at 10 stocks and decide that one of them went down and nine of them went up. What is the probability that a stock went down? We want to estimate what that probability is. How would we estimate what's the probability that a stock went down? Okay? If we uh, saw the, ob observed that out of the thousands of stocks, we look at 10 of them and one of them went down. What would be the way that you would estimate what the probability is that a stock, a arbitrary stock went down? Okay? Think about this. If I tell you that there's 10 stocks, I looked at 10 stocks and one of them went down today. What's the probability that, that, that Google went down that day? Okay, Point one, 0 0.1, one tenth. Does everybody see that? And why is that? That you're saying, well, that seems obvious. How many, how much, how many, does that seem obvious to people? Okay, or does that seem not why that, what, why not? Okay. One way to estimate something would be to try to estimate this probably might be from observations. But a better way, th th uh, okay, and we come up with a one tenth that way. But let's make that more rigorous. If we lived in a world where we saw that there were 10 stocks and one of them went down and the other nine didn't, what is the probability that this happened? If there was an underlying probability that, um, that, that, that one of them went down, uh, that, 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 of P that a stock went down, there is a certain probability that, that we will see any particular outcome. Okay? So suppose we saw a world where one went up and nine went down. Right? What's the probability that an, a random stock went down? Okay? If the underlying probability we want to determine is P, once we know what that probability P is, it should be clear that the probability of seeing one up and nine down is p times one minus p to the ninth. So we multiply by ten because you took. Uh, I'm not sure to just specify any one of the stocks. Okay, so one possibility might be. Let, let's think about it. What is the probability? In this case, I didn't specify which one, right? I just tell you that uh, if all the information we have is somebody looked at ten stocks and tells me that one of them went up, right? Then this is the information that I have. If they, if they told me, I agree with you that if, if they actually told me that Google went down, what's the probability that Google went down and all the other, and, and um, GM went up and, and uh, somebody, Ford went up? Then this probability would be different. But if all that we're talking about is what is the probability of seeing one up and nine down in a world where there is, a, is an underlying coin toss probability of P, the probability of seeing what we actually see is P times one minus P to the ninth. Does that make sense? Okay, because we saw in some sense one head and nine tails. Suppose we see one head and nine tails. What is the probability of getting a head on an individual coin? 
Well, one way to figure that out, to estimate what that P is, is to say, given that we saw this, we should set P to be the value that maximizes the probability of what we saw. Okay? We saw one head and nine tails. If there is an underlying probability of heads of P, the probability of seeing one head and nine tails is P times one minus P to the ninth. If this is what we saw, to maximize the probability that we, we in fact saw what we saw, we want to find the P that maximizes this expression. To maximize that expression, we could take the derivative of it and set the derivative to be zero. Remember when you have a function, how do you find what the maximum of a function is? Okay? If you took a look at that, some function here, and you want to find a function that is given analytically, algebraically, like that, how would you find out what the maximum value is? What parameter maximizes it? Well, you take the derivative of it, right? And see where the derivative is equal to zero. When the derivative of a function is equal to zero, it's either a maxima or a minima, right? And you take the second derivative to figure that out. So the idea of the maximum likelihood thing is, take, this is the probability that we saw what we saw given P. We'll set P to maximize the probability that, that we saw what we saw. By taking the derivative of this, okay, we end up getting this function. Okay, setting that equal to zero and solving for P, in fact, tells us that P is equal to one-tenth. And this gives us a maximum likelihood way to estimate what that parameter P is. Any questions about that? Okay. This could, yeah, question. Go up, right? right. But you said. Okay, I reversed up and down. Okay, let's think of it as heads and tails. Okay? We're trying to estimate what is, you look at a coin. It flipped, you see the other coin flips. You saw one head and nine tails. What is the, the, the fairness of that coin? How can we estimate this? We will say, the using the maximum likelihood method, we'll say, Given the, the, the bias of the coin, this is the probability we saw what we did. To estimate what B is, we'll say, since we saw it, it must have been the most likely thing. And so we will find the P that maximizes that. Okay? In this case, by taking the derivative, setting it to zero, and solving for it. Okay? And that gives us the value of one tenth. Any questions? Here, in fact, is just an uh, analytical way of doing it. This is, uh, I didn't want it to do the algebra. Here is our function that we talked about. I got into a computer algebra system and took the derivative. If we plot what that derivative is, the derivative crosses the x-axis at exactly one-tenth, okay? Proving that p equals one-tenth is somehow either the maximum or minimum value. And it's readily shown to be the one that maximizes that. Any questions? So what's neat about this maximum likelihood approach? It provides a well-defined, defensible criteria to select models. I didn't have to think about um, what was the error term, whether I should be squaring the error or not squaring the error. Okay? It gives me some, so maximum likelihoods are an interesting alternate criteria to fit these models. Okay? Any questions? And in fact, for many of these models, you can do this analytically, okay, in interesting ways. For the Garch model, just to finish up here, for the Garch model, okay, the, um, if we assume that the daily returns are normally distributed about a mean, okay, the variance is then going to be somehow, you know, sampled around a mean, if we assume that the returns are normally distributed, then the probability of having a big return one way or another is small, right? We can now 
once we have the idea that they're normally distributed, we can map a particular observation to a probability by using sort of the normal probability distribution. What is the probability we observe a UI? If it is normally distributed, given the variance, the, 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 the standard deviation, or equivalently the variance of our distribution, we can figure out what was the probability we saw that deviation. Correct? If so, if we want to figure out what is the probability we saw the complete time series of returns we saw, well, it's the probability that we saw today's return times the probability we saw yesterday's return times the probability we saw the day before that. And this gives us what is the probability we see these returns as a function of the variance, which is what we really want to estimate. If we take the logarithms of this expression, okay, that's the product of these terms, the logarithm comes out to be a function like this, which is again a function of the variance. Since maximizing the probability of the expression was the same as maximizing the problem of the logarithm, what we really seek, if we have a maximum likelihood criteria way of assessing a volatility estimate, we want to try to find the estimator such that it maximizes, it, 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 it maximizes this sum. We want to find what is the volatility estimate that maximizes this sum. And this likelihood criteria now gives us an, a way to, to, to assess how good or bad a particular variance prediction is. Okay, And thus, what are the best um, alpha, beta, and gamma to be found numerically? Any questions about that for Garch models? Okay. Any questions? These macro likelihood models are interesting. They're a whole other class of these things. Okay? But I think if you look at that and think about it, you'll see why they make some sense. Any questions? Okay, think about that. Thanks for your attention. And next class, we're going to look at a different class of time series analysis, spectral methods. Okay? Instead of these ARIMA models. Okay, thanks for your attention. Oh, and those of you, next week we're going to have some um, presentations. My R people are going tomorrow, right? Uh, next class, right? Yeah. Uh, who are my crisp people? Okay, you're going on Thursday, right? And I have a quant lit people. Who are my quant lit people? You're going on Thursday, right? Okay, send me notes of your presentation beforehand just so I can comment on them. Okay, or come and talk to me afterward just so we can make sure we go over this a little bit. You've got 20 minutes to do your thing. Okay, any questions? Thanks for your attention. I'll talk to you guys later.